as Helen said, uh, I'm Lauren. I'm the first Dan Norman Early Career Fellow here at Balliol. Um, and I'm really honored to speak to you all today. Um, so a key theme that has uh, linked my research projects over the years has been understanding how uh, environmental cues influence our behavior. I'm particularly interested in under understanding the neurobiology that underlies the phenomenon in uh, the cases of addiction. How do neutral cues in our environment become imbued with and maintain the power to produce cravings and drive relapse, even after um, patients have successfully abstained from drug use for decades. Uh, today, I'll give you an overview of my work trying to understand the mechanisms in the brain that are uh, responsible for this. So I'll start by uh, briefly introducing addiction and the dopamine system. And then I'll give an overview of my studies into how the dopamine system mediates uh, cue-driven behaviors in the context of addiction. I'll uh, then conclude by discussing some of my ongoing work, which is aimed at determining how other systems in the brain might be contributing to cue-controlled behavior as well. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Here we go. So um, addiction is a chronic brain disorder which is characterized by uh, compulsive drug seeking and continued drug use despite harmful consequences. This disorder can affect anyone from any background, social status, race or gender. Um, while there's no known single factor that determines whether an individual will develop an addiction, there are several risk factors that um, are known to increase the um, likelihood of development of an addiction. And some major vulnerability factors include genetics, um, instability or bullying in the home or social environments, trauma and abuse, um, and stress. And like I said, these are known to increase um, the likelihood of developing an addiction, but you don't even necessarily have to have any one of these um, factors. Addiction can be broken down into three major phases. So following initial drug use, um, there's a protracted intoxication phase during which drug intake tends to escalate. And this is seen as both an escalation in the amount of drug that's taken per dose, um, as well as an escalation in the amount of time spent procuring and using drugs. It's in this phase during which uh, drug use becomes uh, compulsive or problematic. Following, um, next we have the withdrawal phase. So immediately following the termination of drug use, um, physical and psychological withdrawal symptoms can emerge. In many cases, these negative withdrawal symptoms will um, drive the resumption, resumption of drug use so um, that withdrawal symptoms can be avoided altogether. However, when abstinence from drug is maintained beyond this withdrawal period, a phase is entered where people can become um, preoccupied with thoughts of seeking and taking drugs. And this is what we call um, cravings. So cravings can be triggered suddenly by stress or unexpectedly encountering environmental cues that were previously associated with drug use. Um, and cravings can powerfully influence behavior um, and stimulate drug seeking and are often the cause of um, relapse of drug use. This is why even after um, years or even decades of maintained abstinence, um, the risk of relapse is still very high because um, unexpected exposure to cues might cause a surge of craving. So something that um, is important to highlight for um, background of the research I'll talk about today is that um, the majority of those who use drugs actually won't develop substance use disorders. So many people um, can use drugs recreationally and this doesn't have a negative impact on their life. Um, so this is important because we need to understand why this is. And my research aims to understand the mechanisms in the brain that underlie these individual differences in susceptibility to develop addictions and in determining um, what signals in the brain drive the escalation of drug use um, and precipitation of craving. If we can develop a better understanding of what's happening in the brain at a sub-second timescale during drug use and cravings, um, we might be able to develop more efficacious therapeutic tools 
for relapse prevention and reduction of drug use. Uh, one of the key players in regulating addiction-related behavior is um, in the brain is dopamine. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is synthesized and released by a subset of neurons in the brain. And once it's released, dopamine can go on to bind dopamine receptors on other neurons and thus influence activity patterns at those target neurons. The main part of the brain's dopamine system we're gonna talk about today is the meso mesolimbic dopamine pathway. Um, this is just a large population of dopamine neurons whose cell bodies are clustered deep within the brain. They send long range axons forward to supply dopamine to a part of the brain called the striatum. This area is colloquially known as the brain's reward center. And this pathway is really interesting because it's highly, highly conserved across species from all phyla and it's key for evolutionary fitness as it's involved in signaling relationships between environmental stimuli and the outcomes that they predict. So this is of course critical for um, basic survival functions like foraging, avoiding predators and selecting mates, but it's activity in these same cells that's also contributing to maladaptive drug use. All known misused drugs have been shown to stimulate dopamine release in this pathway in some way. Um, and importantly, not only do the drugs themselves have the ability to stimulate dopamine release, but also cues that are paired with drugs can gain the ability to stimulate surges of dopamine release. For someone with a substance use disorder, um, a drug paired cue could be something like an object, a place, or a person that they associate with drug use. So encountering um, relevant drug paraphernalia or going to a place where they've previously used drugs might serve as a cue. Um, much of my previous work is focused on understanding how um, these cue evoked dopamine responses contribute to addiction related behaviors. When I started my PhD, it was well understood that cue evoked dopamine release was an important mediator of addiction related behavior, but it wasn't clear whether dopamine release evoked by cues was a dynamic, did it change over the course of long-term drug use? Um, it was also not agreed upon whether it was increases in dopamine that were problematic or decreases in dopamine. So um, just an example of what I was facing when I started my PhD, here's an example of two of the most prominent theories describing dopamine's role in addiction. Um, and at face value, they seemed to be in conflict. Um, you'll have to excuse my use of Homer Simpson images here, but these are just the best images I found to highlight the differences between these two theories. Um, the first theory we have suggests that dopamine um, serves as a satiety signal. So following drug consumption, elevation in dopamine acts as a, um, a satiety signal, suppressing further drug intake. It's only then once dopamine levels drop below a certain threshold that that lack of dopamine satiety signal would promote drug taking. On the other hand, um, there's another theory which states that dopamine serves as a craving signal, suggested that elevated dopamine um, promotes craving and uh, promotes drug seeking behavior. So in one case, it's being suggested that decreases in dopamine are pro-addictive by driving increased drug intake. On the other hand, um, this theory suggests that increases in dopamine are pro-addictive, enhancing drug seeking and craving. Despite there being ample evidence to suggest that dopamine release is involved in both signaling satiety and craving, um, the addiction research community had kind of spent decades pitting these theories against one another rather than really trying to understand if and how dopamine might actually just be serving both of these purposes. Um, and so we wondered whether um, the dopamine release that stimulated, uh, so sorry, I um, missed one point. So if you pay close attention, these two theories relate to completely different behaviors. One is focused on dopamine's role in regulating drug intake, while the other is um, discussing the regulation of drug seeking. And these behaviors occur in two completely different contexts um, within uh, the drug, um, drug abuse cycle. Uh, 
So um, one is during active drug use and the other is outside of periods of active drug use. We wondered whether um, the dopamine release stimulated by a drug paired cue might differ if the cue was experienced in these two different contexts. Um, and perhaps this might help to explain um, why we have these two theories that that face value seem to be in conflict. Perhaps they actually aren't. So um, if we think about the differences in the function that a cue serves in a drug taking versus a drug seeking context, um, this can help explain why we might expect the dopamine responses to differ. So um, let's consider the example of the drug use paraphernalia pictured here. During active drug use, these paraphernalia might serve as a confirmatory cue, indicating that previous drug seeking actions were successful, drug delivery is imminent, and that drug seeking can be terminated because you've now obtained drug. Whereas if these same drug paraphernalia were encountered unexpectedly um, during a period of abstinence, this might instead signal that drug might be available nearby and the appropriate response would be to look for drug or drug seek. So um, what do the dopamine responses to the same drug cue look like in these two conditions? And how do these signals change or evolve over the course of long-term drug use? Does this influence behavior? Um, we suspected that it might. So um, to test this hypothesis in rodents, I used a model of drug use in which rats self-administered cocaine by nose poking into a port in, in order to receive intravenous cocaine infusions. This gave the animals complete control over how much drug that they consumed and allowed us to make comparisons between animals that had different drug intake patterns. Importantly, um, each drug infusion was paired with the presentation of a drug paired cue. So the animals come to associate this cue with the drug delivery. Um, I used a method called Vascan cyclic voltammetry to measure dopamine responses um, that were stimulated by, um, by drug paired cues. Um, and I did so by implanting tiny electrodes. These are smaller than the diameter of a human hair. Um, I implanted them into the stratum. And because dopamine is an electroactive molecule, if we apply um, a voltage with a waveform that sweeps past the oxidation potential of dopamine, um, we oxidize any dopamine molecules that are present at the electrode surface. And when they lose, um, when these dopamine molecules lose electrons, we're able to detect that as current. So I can measure um, dopamine release in real time while an animal is, is performing behavior. I use this uh, method to measure the Q elicited dopamine responses in both drug taking and drug seeking contexts. Um, and so the key difference between these contexts is just that um, in a drug taking context, the Q comes as a result of the animal's behavior and is paired with the drug delivery. Whereas in a drug seeking context, the cues are presented unexpectedly in the absence of drug. And it's very well established that these cue presentations um, in the absence of drug do stimulate drug seeking behavior. I was able to uh, measure and compare these cue evoked dopamine responses um, in both contexts throughout the course of long-term drug use as well as abstinence to see how these signals evolved. And together um, with another set of experiments in which I artificially enhanced Q elicited dopamine responses, I was able to assess how Q elicited dopamine impacted both drug intake as well as drug seeking behavior. So um, in a single slide, I have distilled the main findings of seven years of experiments into two take home messages. Um, the, the first finding is that um, we have, we observe as in humans, um, in our rodent population, there are individual differences in susceptibility to addiction-like behavior within our rodent population. Animals that are susceptible exhibit stronger addiction-like behavior, and they do so because their cue evoked dopamine responses are dynamic. Um, and this is true whether um, we measure the res uh, responses in a drug-taking or drug-seeking context. 
In drug taking contexts, we see Q evoked dopamine responses get smaller over time, and this drives the animals to escalate their drug intake. Um, and in drug seeking contexts, the Q evoked dopamine responses got larger over time, and that drove increased drug seeking. And this was not the case for um, the addiction resilient animals, for which Q elicited dopamine responses were stable over time. And similarly, drug related behaviors were also stable. Um, so these animals did not escalate their drug intake and they exhibited lower level um, drug seeking behavior. The second take home message was just that um, the same drug paired cues produce vastly different dopamine responses when they're experienced in drug taking versus drug seeking contexts. So we see diametric changes in these signals to the same cue measured in the same animal on the same days when the cues were experienced in these two different contexts. So just to summarize this part of the talk, um, we were able to show that diametric dopamine signals evoked by the same drug cue in these different contexts contribute to both pathological drug use as well as drug seeking behaviors. And so these theories shouldn't be viewed as competing theories, but rather theories describing separate phases of the addiction cycle. And overall, we find that dynamic changes in cue evoked dopamine contribute to multiple key aspects of the addiction process and that the directionality of these changes is dependent upon the context in which the cues are experienced. So, um, the final point I'd just like to make here is that, you know, these findings suggest that therapeutics which are designed to target the dopamine system directly um, should be approached with caution because, um, you know, these data suggest that if we were to treat someone with uh, a dopamine enhancing drug to help them to uh, decrease their drug intake, it might also promote drug seeking. And alternatively, if we were to give an abstinent patient um, a dopamine suppressing drug to help mitigate cravings, and they did relapse, it could drive them to take more drug and put them at further risk. So um, we, this in combination with historical evidence suggesting that dopamine um, targeting drugs are um, not ideal to be used for other reasons because they also impact um, all the other um, all the other things that the dopamine system mediates, like mood and motivation more broadly, um, suggests we need to develop uh, better pharmacological interventions that will allow us to alter dopamine release in much more subtle and specific ways. Um, for example, trying to selectively target Q of a dopamine release rather than altering dopamine generally across the board. So um, how might this be achieved? In the next part of the talk, um, I'll discuss my research looking at how other neural circuits interact with the dopamine system. And it's the hope that by understanding these interactions, we might find better drug targets. So um, following the previous work I showed you, I began to ask um, what biological mechanisms might uh, be responsible for regulating dopamine release to these cues that I observed in um, drug seeking versus drug taking contexts. And canonically, when we think about neurons and the mechanisms that govern neurotransmitter release, we think about the multitude of receptors and channels that are present on the cell body that tightly control the electrical activity of a cell and determine when action potentials can be generated. And then action potentials travel down the axon and trigger neurotransmitter release. However, um, sorry, <laughs> recent work has demonstrated that um, at least in the case of dopamine neurons, neurotransmission can also be modulated at the other end of the cell, at the axon terminals where a neurotransmitter is being released. So um, one example of this modulation of dopamine at the releasing end of the cell is um, mediated by acetylcholine. Like dopamine, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, which is released by a subset of neurons in the brain. Um, acetylcholine in the striatum is supplied by a small population of cholinergic neurons 
These cells are what we call tonically active cells. And this means that at baseline, they're constantly kind of ticking away, firing at low frequency. And because um, they have enormous, highly branched axonal projections, they blanket the entire stratum and bathe it in acetylcholine. Their terminals are also intertwined with the similarly largely branched dopamine axon terminals. And importantly, um, dopamine axon terminals express nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. This enables acetylcholine to bind and regulate dopamine release. So how does acetylcholine impact dopamine release? Does it increase it? Does it decrease it? Our um, understanding of this interaction between acetylcholine and dopamine um, was actually pioneered here at Oxford by my mentor, Stephanie Craig, and her lab. Um, her lab did experiments where they electrically stimulated dopamine release in brain slices, and they measured dopamine released in response to this, um, both in the presence and in the absence. Oh, sorry, that's my electrode. So I measured dopamine release both in the presence and in the absence of acetylcholine. When you stimulate dopamine release um, at uh, increasing with increasing frequency stimulations. What you can see um, in the solid black traces, when acetylcholine is present, um, the responses are maintained, they, they don't change with increasing um, frequency. Whereas in the absence of acetylcholine, as you can see in the dotted black traces, we see that the dopamine responses are much more dynamic. And so this demonstrated that cholinergic input onto dopamine terminals is able to modify ongoing dopamine release stimulated by action potentials. And the directionality of this modification depends upon the frequency that dopamine neurons are firing at. So when dopamine um, firing is at low frequency, um, acetylcholine is actually boosting dopamine signals. And when dopamine firing is at high frequency, acetylcholine makes them smaller. So acetylcholine seems to be acting as sort of like a filter, and it's constraining dopamine release when it's present. The lab additionally found this strange effect whereby if they delivered a surge of acetylcholine alone, um, they saw this that this is capable in and of itself of driving dopamine release. So the dopamine cells don't even have to fire action potentials on their own, um, the acetylcholine is capable of creating action potentials and generating dopam uh, dopamine release. So together, from all of these studies done in brain slices, it's clear that acetylcholine can modify dopamine release um, in multiple interesting ways, but brain slices are a long way from a whole animal. And, you know, is this happening in vivo during behavior? Is this uh, phenomenon relevant to um, Q-driven behavior. What do we know about striatal acetylcholine in behavior? Well, in comparison to dopamine, we know a lot less about striatal acetylcholine. Um, this is partially because prior to um, the advent of the recent uh, genetically encoded methods that enable us to target this really small population of cells, um, these cells were really hard to study. But what we did know um, is that acetylcholine in the striatum was involved in signaling relationships between stimuli and the outcomes that they predict, it was involved in motivation, movement, and behavioral flexibility. And this is really striking because as we know, striatal dopamine is also involved in some way in mediating many of these processes. And further, when we look um, at the coincident timing of the dynamic changes in cholinergic and dopaminergic neurons in response to stimuli like cues and rewards, you see that the activity is dynamic during the same periods um, that dopamine neurons are in cholinergic cells. So cholinergic cells are seemingly well poised to modify dopamine signals to things like cues and rewards, um, and they're involved in regulating similar behaviors to dopamine neurons together suggesting that the interaction of these two systems is likely playing an important role in mediating um, reward-guided behavior. So um, the goal of my current studies, which are still ongoing, is to try to put all of this together and work out 
when and how these systems work together. Um, so you'll notice I'm taking a step back from the addiction models here, and this is because we need to first characterize the role that acetylcholine plays in reward-guided decision-making in general before we can really assess its impact on addiction. So um, how do we measure acetylcholine during behavior? Uh, until recently, we weren't um, able to measure it easily in vivo. And recently, um, these sensors have been developed, um, which enable us to, um, to finally do this. And this has really rev revolutionized the field. So um, in order to do this, I in, uh, inject a virus into mice, which causes the neurons that, that the virus infects to insert these acetylcholine sensors into their membranes. These acetylcholine sensors are um, fusion proteins, which are made by attaching a fluorescent GFP protein to a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, which has been mutated such that when acetylcholine binds to it, it will fluoresce. I um, also implant then a tiny fiber optic probe above the striatum where these um, fluorescent uh, sensors have, have also been injected. And I can then um, measure acetylcholine release while mice are performing a behavioral task. So um, the behavioral task I use is pretty complicated. I could spend 25 minutes just explaining it. Um, so I will spare you the full rundown. But the main idea is really just that um, mice are put in a position where they need to choose between poking into ports that have different transition probabilities that lead them to other locations where um, the probability of uh, being rewarded differs. Over time, the animals learn that certain actions have a greater or lower likelihood of lead it, leading them to um, getting reward. And every once in a while, what we do is we change the reward contingencies on the animal so that um, they have to reassess and relearn new rules. And we're able to see what happens in the brain while this goes on. So as animals are performing this task, we measure cholinergic signals that are evoked by cues, as well as rewards that they encounter. And here I have a short video clip so you can see what a mouse actually looks like while they're performing the task. Um, it's a bit hard to see from above, but each time the center port indicated by the red arrow lights up, mouse can poke in and initiate a trial. The two side ports will then light up and they have to choose one of those. And their choice probabilistically determines whether the top or bottom port will become active. And at any given point, one of those has a higher likelihood of um, yielding reward. Essentially, the animal has to learn whether top or bottom port is um, more likely to be rewarded, and then they learn to choose um, left versus right accordingly to get them there. You can also th see um, in the video the thin fiber optic cable coming out of the mouse's head, and that's what we're um, using to collect our data through. And the mice will do four or 500 trials per day in this task to earn um, four microliter water droplets. So it's very high yield data. Um, throughout the, um, all the possible trial conditions of the task. So um, what does the cholinergic recording data look like that we get from this? These are um, cholinergic signals from rewarded trials in blue and unrewarded trials in red. I've marked the points where um, cues are occurring, telling the animal whether or not this trial will be rewarded. Um, that's what this blue bar is the cue, and um, when the outcome is delivered. So reward is delivered here on rewarded trials. The take hope here is that we're able to see these clear reward and cue related signals in cholinergic interneurons in the task. Um, and I have a pile of data I'm currently analyzing, um, trying to understand um, what's going on under all our dis different task conditions. But um, essentially what we're seeing is that our cholinergic cells are active in the striatum at the same time points that we know dopamine neurons are active in this same task. And so we feel we're on the right track to begin to unpick these interactions between the two systems. 
So, um, so far what I showed you today is the results from the kind of first project objective. I've measured cholinergic activity um, during reward guided decision making. And I'm very lucky that um, a graduate student in the lab, Marta Blanco Pozo, has been recording dopamine activity in the same task. So we're currently working together to cross correlate the dopaminergic and cholinergic signals obtained so we can determine at what points in the task um, is acetylcholine likely influencing dopamine. And then, of course, we'll um, use this to inform uh, further experiments to test the actual causal relationships between these two systems. So we'll have to then manipulate cholinergic activity during cues and rewards to assess these impacts. So to conclude and summarize everything I've shown you today, um, first I showed you how um, dynamic changes in Q evoked dopamine release contribute to multiple different core um, aspects of addiction um, and that the directionality of the changes in dopamine um, depend upon the context in which cues are experienced. Finally, um, I showed you that um, cholinergic regulation of dopamine release seems likely to impact cue driven behaviors as well. And so um, we're really hoping to um, follow up on this and understand whether or not we can um, use a pharmacological target, use the cholinergic system as a pharmacological target to um, if, and, and see whether this has more utility uh, as a therapeutic target in addiction. Um, it's possible this could have allow us a more fine-tuned approach for modifying Q evoked dopamine responses since um, there are many cholinergic drugs on the market. They have a lot more specificity than dopamine drugs. Um, it'll be really interesting to see where this goes. Um, and, and certainly it'd be ideal if we could um, find a way to dampen Q driven craving um, without impacting uh, drug intake. So um, before I stop for questions, I just want to acknowledge um, all of you for um, attending today and listening to my talk, um, and also acknowledge my um, mentors, both um, Paul Phillips, who was my mentor at the University of Washington for my dissertation work, which is the first part of the talk I discussed, um, and then my mentors here at Oxford, Mark Walton and Stephanie Craig, who've um, helped guide me through um, the design of the, my current projects. Um, as well as um, other members of the lab who contributed to the projects. Um, and finally, I'd like to um, thank my uh, funding sources, including National Science Foundation and um, the Dan Norman Fund at Balliol College, um, and also to my cat, Louie, who puts up with me while I grumble about data analysis. <laughs>